Hey there, I'm Mike Rugnetta. This is Crash Course Mythology, and today we're going to shift just slightly from our discussion of monsters to talk about monstrous humans, monstrous human women to be exact. We're discussing witches and hags, many scary, magical ladies. You know what's scariest about them? It's their giant gross moles. Just kidding. It's their habit of turning people into stone. Tote! No! <laughs> Before we start, a quick reminder that many cultures which created these myths are patriarchal, and many of the stories we're going to look at are more than a little misogynistic. Devoting an episode to terrifying women doesn't mean we're endorsing the idea that women, especially older, wiser women, are horrible. And actually, in many stories, it's not even clear whether these women are really so horrible. They may just be trying to protect themselves and their place in the social or metaphysical order. Really, one myth's forest hag might be another's fairy godmother after just a little shift in perspective. Anyway, just something to keep in mind while we're dissing on all these hags. So when I say witch, there's almost certainly an image that comes to mind. Many myths, especially folk and fairy tales, feature old women described as ugly or misshapen and with frightening magical powers. There are a few exceptions, but most witches use their powers for evil. Depending upon the tradition, witch is synonymous with or akin to hag. In many myths, hags are magical old women who are responsible for giving people bad dreams. Some hags even sit on the chest of their sleeping victims, sprinkling bad images into their minds. In Norse mythology, the hag is called a mare or mara, and they come in the night to torment you. A mare at night, a eh? nightmare. Get it? That's a thing. A nightmare. In Celtic mythology, there's a hag called the Kalach, who often appears with a staff and likes to make everybody cold and miserable. In one Scottish tradition, she comes down from her mountain home on November 1st, beats her staff on the ground, and ushers in winter. But not all Kalachs manifest such awesome power. In one story, the Kalach is basically just a petty thief. This story begins long ago in the parish of Kirk Lonan, where the widow Ine McCarran lives with her three daughters, Calibreed, Caliphany, and Calivara. Their father, having died years ago, left behind a leather bag full of gold coins that Ine keeps under the hearthstone in front of the fire. The gold coins are how she provides for the family. One day, an old hag comes knocking at the door. Spoiler alert, she's the Kalach. And she's a hungry Kalach at that. Ine just sees an old woman, though, and she doesn't like to turn a beggar away, so she invites the Kalach in for soup. When she returns with a shawl to comfort the shivering old woman, the Kalach is gone, and so is the McCarran stash. Without their gold, the family is hungry and desperate. Eventually, Calibreed, the oldest, tells her mother that she's leaving to make her fortune, and that if she doesn't return in a year, they can assume that she's made it big. Ine bakes her daughter an oat cake for her journey, but before sending her off, Ine asks for one piece of it in exchange for a blessing. But Calibreed doesn't know when she's going to have her next meal, so she refuses her mother. Early in her journey, Calibreed finds a house and, surprise, the Kalach lives there. The Kalach offers Calibreed a job as her maid, but only on one condition. Never clean the chimney. Calibreed agrees and goes to sleep. The next day, Calibreed definitely looks in the chimney, where, lo and behold, she finds her family's lost bag of gold. Without thinking twice, she sets out for home. So let's see what happens next in the Thought Bubble. On her way home, Calibreed passes a horse who asks her to rub him down. Calibreed refuses. Later, she passes a sheep who asks her to shear him. Again, she refuses. Then she passes a goat, a lime kiln, a cow, and finally, a mill refuses them all. At this point, she's so tired that she goes inside the mill and falls asleep. In the meantime, the Kalak returns home to find that the bag of gold is missing. Running outside, she finds a horse. Have you seen a girl pass this way? I have, says the horse. The same with the sheep, the goat, the lime kiln, the cow, and the mill, who says, I've got her sleeping inside me right now. The Kala creeps inside and touches Calibreed's shoulder with a hazel wand, turning her into stone. A year and a day later, the second daughter, Caliphany, decides it's her turn to go fortune seeking. And it's the same deal. Oatcake, no blessing, maid job, chimney, bag grab, horse, sheep, 
goat, kiln, cow, mill refusal, falling asleep, and, yep, turned to stone. Another year and a day later, it's Calivara's turn. Unlike her greedy sisters, she gives a piece of the oat cake to her mother. She takes the job, steals the gold, gets on her way. But when she comes across the horse, she rubs it down. She shears the sheep and changes the goat's tether, cleans the lime kiln and milks the cow. She turns the mill and after all her hard work, she falls asleep on a sack of flour, presumably not noticing the stone statues of her sisters. When the Kalach rushes off to find Kalivara, she asks the animals and the kiln if they've seen her and each one says no. When she gets to the mill and asks if it saw the girl, the mill catches the Kalach in its cogs and grinds her up. Thanks, that bubble. The Kalach screams, wake, Kalivara and the helpful mill tells her to pick up the wand and touch the stones in the corner. As soon as the wand touches them, they turn back in to her very surprised sisters. The mill then tells Kalivara to touch the wand to the leather bag and it will never be empty, and then to burn the wand so it can never harm anyone again. The girls do as they're told and return home to their mother with the leather bag. This story contains a lot of familiar tropes of the dangerous and devious witch. She looks like an old woman, she shows up on someone's doorstep, she has a house in the woods, and she has a magic wand that she uses for nefarious purposes. And like monsters and other mythical creatures, she's notable for her ugly, wrinkly appearance. It's kind of a bummer that old age is used as a sign of evil so often. I mean, I've met a ton of old folks, and only like six of them tops were probably magical villains. Another hideous old woman who is more than she seems is Baba Yaga. And no, the story is not about John Wick, it's about the hag of Russia and Eastern Europe. But she's just as terrifying if you cross her, with bulging eyes that can turn people to stone. Apparently, stoning people is like the go-to spell for old magical ladies. Anyway, she lives alone in a birch forest in a hut that sits atop a pair of chicken legs. The hut is surrounded by human skulls, and each day the hut is visited by three ghostly riders, one dressed in white, one in red, and one in black. These riders represent the passage of time. Baba Yaga flies through the night sky on a giant mortar that she rows with a giant pestle. She wipes away her tracks with a birch broom, and like the Wendigo, she's a cannibal with a penchant for luring princesses to her hut for... <clears throat> dinner. According to Brenda Rosen, some scholars believe that originally Baba Yaga was a potent female nature spirit, a provider of healing, protection, and guidance. In this respect, she's similar to another terrifying female creature from Greek mythology, the Gorgon Medusa. This snake-headed, stone-making lady may not seem to be much of a protector or a guide, but there's one myth that says blood from the right side of a Gorgon can bring a corpse back to life, while blood from the left side is deadly poison. Turns out, also, the name Medusa is related to the ancient Greek word for protect, and can be translated as guardian. So maybe she just has a bad reputation because of mean old Perseus, and of course her petrifying visage. These three different frightening females are from different times and places, but they have a number of things in common. They're hideous, ancient, and dangerous. One wrong move, and you get turned to stone. Hags are seen as monstrous because of their ability to transform themselves and others, and their tricky, conniving ways. But perhaps they also reflect a societal discomfort with old age, which works its own transformations on the body. In cultures that valorize youth, that old age can seem terrifying, especially when it comes to women. But old age is also very powerful. Especially when you have a hazel wand or a snake hairdo to swing around. Next time, we start our two-episode wrap-up of the whole series. I know, I'm gonna miss you too, Tote. I'm also gonna miss you guys. We're gonna talk about Freud and Jung and the psychological aspects of mythology. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Unless Baba Yaga sees you first. Check out our Crash Course Mythology tote, tote bag, and poster. Available now at dftba.com. Crash Course Mythology is filmed in the Chad and Stacy Emigolts studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, and is produced with the help of all of these very nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course exists thanks to the generous support of our patrons at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the content you love through a monthly donation and help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever. Crash Course is made with Adobe Creative Cloud. Check the description for a link to a free trial. Thanks for watching, and your grandparents might be old, but that annual sweatsuit they gift you is not a curse. Or maybe it is.